Good afternoon and welcome to Take the Lead. I am your host, Mark Seal. And we are live as we are every Thursday. This is a fully live, fully interactive guitar show. You can interact via the chat, via the polls, lots of ways to get involved. And the premise of the show is really quite simple. Basically, you send in us videos and uh, something you're working on, maybe a song, a riff, some technique. We're going to watch it together as a guitar community. We're going to break it down and find ways to uh, share what you're doing right, maybe, and help you on some of the things that are more challenging and get you on your way on your musical journey. Uh, the cool thing about today's show also is we always have our welcome to the stage where we bring inspired guitar related videos to you so you can watch some some other people and make you want to play guitar more practice more that type of thing we also have our take the lead section that's where you take the lead and you get to dictate what i do for one of the last sections of the show and we do that by way of the polls so if you see a poll on your screen vote for what you want to see at the end of the show and whichever one of those wins is what we will be doing for you and then we also have at the very end of the show name that tune this is where you can win some elixir swag, whether strings or a mug or something. We'll see what it is today. Uh, as always, I'm always kept in the dark till the last minute. But uh, you want to get involved, so definitely get in the chat room, be involved with today's show, ask me questions. We'll do our Q&A section. I love talking about all of this stuff. But the good news is, you know what? Take lead, it starts now. All right, our first section, as always, is setting the stage. And setting the stage is where we play the video that we talked about. Uh, where we're going to figure out what we're working on today. And this week's video comes from Jeff out in San Clemente. Super cool video. I just saw it briefly during sound check today. And it's going to be fun because this show, probably more than any other show, is going to be completely improvised, which most of them are. But I'm going to just watch this. And I try to tr uh, treat these shows as though you were in a lesson with me. And if you've talked to any of my students that have taken private lessons, they will all tell you this show is very authentic in that regard because I don't over prepare for it. That's sometimes good, sometimes bad, but it makes it really live and really fun for me. And usually I can give you a lesson that's actually really related to what you're doing. So with that, let's roll the video from Jeff and let's see what we got going on today. What's up, Mark? I got a question about uh, tapping technique. So typically what I'll do, uh, if I want to attempt you know, some tapping, I'll kind of be strumming away here. And then I'll do this little magic trick here with my finger and I'll put my pick kind of in my middle finger and then I'll tap with my index finger. Um, and then when I want to go back to, to uh, picking, I'll put it back, you know, the other way. So I know this isn't really that efficient, um, but I've been doing it forever and just want to get your thoughts on that. And maybe there's a better way I can do it. So I appreciate the help. Sweet. That's, that is a, a great question. What's interesting for me is that I have a, I have a lot on this whole tapping thing. I think tapping was one of the first, um, first techniques I really got into that I thought uh, differentiated my playing because when I first got into tapping I had a lot of thoughts on it which I want to share with you but first let's address exactly what you talked about my first real question is are you available for uh, for kids parties you know if you got the magic trick maybe you got some sleight of hand stuff be glad to have you come in and impress the kids but as far as the pick goes a lot of us do weird things with that where we hide it we, we get it out of the way for different types of playing so the first thing I would tell you that I think is really important and what I've, I've kind of self-assessed and watched players and tried to figure out logically what made sense, I think it's really important most of the time when you're tapping to be able to keep your pick in the ready position. This is the first conclusion I came to with picking years ago because I had one, uh, one guitar line I really wanted to do. I think I was, it's in one of my guitar solos off a really early record. And I was doing some, um, some sweet picking and I also wanted to throw some tapping in there. And the challenge I ran into is like you, I originally, when I first started tapping, I did the same thing, first finger, did the Van Halen thing, right? You put the pick in your mouth and you get your finger, which is pretty gross and quite frankly, not a big fan of, of that, but also it wasn't very efficient, which is probably more to the point. So I was doing some phrase where I was doing this like a hammer on and a rake, right? You can do a close up and you'll see what's going on with the pick. I'm doing this thing here. So I'm raking, like we've talked about, let me get some doors out there. But I also wanted to throw in a tap at the end of it. So I did this thing. Right? And that's not possible with what you're doing. You can't do it this quick. But you can't go back and forth that quickly if you're trying to get your pick in and out and change picking fingers. So that was one of the or tapping fingers. So I think that was one of the first things that I thought about. I thought, well, okay, let me be efficient. Ideally, if I use my middle finger, there's a lot to that as far as being able to keep the pick in the ready position. Another part about that is I'd already done some finger picking and some hybrid picking. Uh, a little bit and more finger picking than hybrid at that point. 
but that that second finger on my right hand already kind of has a callus on it just from the, the finger picking I'd been doing. But also when I started doing the tapping, it really kind of solidified that. The, the callus got a little bigger and you, you get a little more control over it. And I thought that was really an important thing. So whenever possible, I think the idea and what I'm getting at with that original question is how do we... <laughs> How do we go back and forth from picking and tapping that quickly? And the obvious answer then is to keep that pick in the ready position. And let's switch our, our tapping to our right hand middle finger instead of the first finger. That's the first thing. But let's talk about tapping in general. One of the things I, I loved about it is, you know, when I first started tapping, we were all doing the Van Halen thing, right? We had, you know, your phaser on, ton of distortion. And that's, that's really cool, and it's, it's fast and flashy, but at the end of the day, it's really just a three-note pattern moved around over the entire fingerboard, and I give full credit to Eddie. I mean, one of my biggest influences, and better player, richer than I'll ever be, so all props to that guy. Um, but what we have here is it's a really simple pattern just done quickly, and when you do something quickly, it's often impressive to people that don't play guitar, uh, regardless of what it is. But what I started thinking about when I started getting very musical, and particularly on my first record, my first real album I did, um, above the clouds years and years ago, I thought, well, what, what can I really do with tapping? And if you take this mindset, I think you'll take tapping a lot further because back in the day, you know, Randy Rhodes and Eddie and those guys, they were playing really cool lines really fast, but a lot of it was very similar. And then every 80s clam rock band kind of did the same thing. They came up with some pattern of notes they could play quickly that sounded cool with tapping. But it wasn't um, as creative as I thought uh, it could be. And, and one of the people, actually, last week, this is cool, I just thought of this right now. Last week, somebody asked me on the show who was my favorite 80s metal band, and I, I cited uh, White Lion with Vito Brada, just the, as guitar players go. And what he did that was so amazing was he took tapping to a whole new level. He did all these different techniques with tapping that you might apply to your, your left hand. And so, for me, I kind of took a similar approach where I, I, I'm looking at the guitar and think, okay, if I can do this tapping, what are the real benefits of tapping? It's not just to play a fast note, but my first conclusion was, wow, it's like having another finger on your left hand, which is, you know, if you've got four fingers, that's 25% more fingers, right? Math was clearly. Um, but it, it basically have another finger, but not only that, it's detached, so you can create intervals that are not as common, right? If, if I'm here, I can only do so much. I can only stretch so far, but if I can tap, I can get these much bigger intervals that I can't physically do on one string, especially uh, on the guitar. So having that, that stretch here and then creating these bigger distances across the fingerboard, you can get some really neat, interesting, um, interesting intervals that just aren't as common, for one. So I realized that and I started trying all these different patterns and, and I started realizing another thing in the process. And, and everything I'm telling you right now is just a data dump. I'm actually reliving this in my head right now because it's, it's making me think. One of the things I remember thinking was that if I play something fast, and my lowest note, say my lowest note is a D on the first string, that 10th fret, my highest note is the, the 13th, right? And then I play those notes. By the way, all these examples I'm gonna do right now are gonna be at the same tempo. Okay. okay, so I play this riff, it's kind of fast, whatever, but the distance from here to here is, is a relatively small distance. And so because that's a small distance, even though I'm going fast, it doesn't sound as fast, right? So if you look at it, do a wide shot, I'll show you. So, if I do the same exact tempo, but I, I make a much bigger interval, say I do like 0, 5, 9, 17. Okay, it's the exact same speed I'm playing on both of those, but the difference is the note, the low note, all the way up to the high note is a bigger interval, and so I'm, I'm covering a bigger distance in the same amount of time, if you look at it in, that, in those terms. And in so doing, you can have these lines that actually sound considerably faster uh, than they might otherwise sound. And again, it's not just about speed, but you can also then come up with some really clever lines, make it sound like a, kind of like a bagpipe, you know, uh, let's see. I wrote this, this lick a while back, I thought it was kind of cool. It's in seven eighths, so it's seven eighth notes for every, every pass, and it gives this kind of weird feel to it. But if I play it slow, this is when you speed that same riff up. You just get these really neat intervals that are not just the same as playing, you know, two or three groups close together that you would, in a normal scale. I think if you put that in terms of something that sounds more familiar is if you take 
a basic pentatonic scale, where I'll do an A minor pentatonic scale. If I just tap this, it just sounds more pentatonic. It doesn't have anything that's really um, unique to it. It's cool, but. It sounds like a pentatonic riff, but when you do some of these different intervals, it just has a different flair to it. So thinking in that I have another finger that can go all over the fingerboard, that was really cool, and I can create these bigger distances between intervals. That was something I thought was really cool. Another thing I did was I kind of had to look at my left hand and say, okay, what does my left hand do? What can it do? And I thought, okay, if really this second finger is just like another second or third finger on my, my left hand, but it's movable, well, then what I can do is I thought, well, I'm playing guitar, what's this? Oh, I'm doing a bend. Well, can this finger bend? Well, yes and no. It's kind of hard to grab that note and physically pull it up by itself. But what you can do is grab a note and use your left hand to kind of lift that note up. So my left hand's doing the bend, and my right hand, the tap finger, is just along for the ride. Now, Jeff, if you are watching this, I'm not sure if you're watching today or not. If you are, you will notice often I do that sleight of hand thing also. But what I do with my sleight of hand that is different than yours uh, is that I put it in my first finger because it's much easier to go from my first finger and just slide it slightly over and it still allows me to tap with my middle finger. So I'm consistent with that middle finger tapping and I can grab my pick quite quickly. So my magic trick would be this. If you, I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> if I think about it, I'll probably drop the pick. But... So I just kind of move it over like that and the point of the pick is kind of going into my finger at the top. It goes back and then when I come back... It's like a... And the weird thing is, I think to your point, is when you do it, you don't even think about it. When I actually tried to break down what I was doing on that, when I thought about it, it was more complex to try to see the motion. Your hand just does it. And I know a lot of guitar players have that same thing. You just come up with a way to do it. You didn't really ever plan it. It was just a way that your, your brain kind of figure out how to get the pick out of the web. Okay, so knowing that I can bend, well, then I can grab a note. Right? When we think about that really famous Van Halen riff. Right? Bending a note up, tapping, and then letting the note come back down. I could also grab the note, half bend. So if you go back to one of our earlier episodes where we talked about bends, you can now apply this technique with another. And I think on the last, last show we did, we were talking about mixing techniques. Well, this is a great example of that, where we're going to take bends and mix them with tapping. And so I thought, okay, that's cool. And I thought, well, what else do I do with my left hand that I might be able to transfer to my right hand as well? And one of the things there was sliding, right? So I could take the same thing. And notice, anytime I'm doing that, I'm doing the exact same thing. If you look at the finger, now let's get a close up, you'll notice my, my second finger on my right hand is basically mirroring that third finger on my left. I can mirror my, my second also. They're basically doing the same thing, just opposite, right? One's coming across the top of the guitar, one's coming from the bottom. But technically, if I play the same note, that's hammering, that's tapping. And you can't really tell the difference. It's the same thing. You're getting that nice arc in your right hand finger here. You're getting the callus, the surface area, nice and dialed in. And then another thing I discovered about this uh, tapping technique that helped me a lot was my ability to mirror what my left hand was doing. And what I mean by that is, I'm gonna go to a clean sound for a setting, or a clean setting. If I'm playing a D major seven chord, for example, right? I can look up ahead and I can see, I can see that exact chord form up on the top part of the guitar now. So it makes the guitar neck significantly smaller. And what I did to practice that a lot, I remember I don't know if I've ever told the story on the show or not, I can't remember. I told it to somebody more recently because of uh, Memorial Day. But uh, the Star Spangled Banner, I remember there was a show called Rock and Jock Baseball on MTV many years ago, and they'd always have you know, Joe Satriani or you know, Dave Mustaine from Megadeth, or I can't remember who all came out, and they all played their version of, of the Star Spangled Banner. Most of them somewhat mirrored what Hendrix did, but each had their own flair. Vi, I'm sure, did his own thing. And I remember thinking as a kid when I saw this show, like, hey, if I ever get to be on that thing, I gotta do something different. And my, my first idea was, to do harmonics. I had never seen anybody play the, the Star Spangled Banner with harmonics. And so I learned that if I can just mirror what my left hand's doing an octave up or 12 frets up. So I would start trying to play a pattern here. So I might play, right? And then up here, I might tap those harmonics up. And all I'm doing is tapping exactly 12 frets up. So I have to look here. This hand still has to play it here. And after you do enough of this, all of a sudden, whatever you're playing with your left hand, 
is really easily transposed to your right hand to move up the fingerboard. It's kind of a cool technique. Um, as far as, as putting all of that together in one riff, there's one riff that I really like that I, I did with this song called Christ Beauty where I do this tapping part. And it's this melodic thing. It wasn't the fast you know, Van Halen thing so much as... And I'm basically playing a C-sharp minor scale with my left hand. I'm doing some tapping on a, a C-sharp minor scale with the right, came up with a melody. I could play that melody easily with no tapping. I mean, I can't right now, I have to figure it out, but it's an easy melody to play, but it sounds really cool with all of that, that tapping and that really legato flavor. And I, I would definitely have to credit Vito brought in some of that. I don't remember if I figured some of this out before or after, but it was definitely that time frame of my life where I was um, getting into that tapping stuff. And it just was kind of cool. One other one I did on an album by All Souls Rising, this metal band I was in, was, I started to get into the two finger tapping, right? And what I did was I came with this riff where I, I bent a note. And then I come up to this, this blues scale. And yeah, that's all tapping, but then right here, I, I did a pull off, tap, and then I used my second finger. If you get a close up, uh, you can see my third finger right here. Gra that finger right there grabs the next string. And then same thing. So the riff, in real time, something like this. And again, that was another different example of how I use tapping as opposed to just trying to play a bunch of notes with it. And, and again, I, I abuse that. Just like we talked, I think it was uh, the Artificial Harmonics show where we were talking about Richie Sambor just abusing Artificial Harmonics on the Dead or Alive cell. I, I abused tapping for many, many years, so don't get me wrong. It's a great way to start, and it's a good way to learn how to do it effectively and efficiently. But once you get it, turn it into music. Find ways, I'll, even to this day, I'll put a bunch of verb on. I'll do, you know, I might bend a note. Right, and I'm just doing half bends, full bends, a little bit of sliding in there. And it becomes this, this very melodic, warm thing that I, I really enjoy about tapping. And we'll, do, we'll get way deeper into tapping, but that's just something I really, I think it's a really neat part of playing guitar. And maybe even on a future show, we'll talk about you know, something we call four finger tapping, where you actually take your right hand, that's uh, going to be some do something where you're actually using all four fingers. What are you doing that? Yeah, my pinky's tough. Right, and you can get where all four fingers ultimately can do that, so it almost becomes kind of like a piano type thing. But back to, let's bring it all back home. Uh, the original question was, hold and pick. The ideal for tapping, use your middle finger, get your hand on, on the top, you know, so you have kind of on the rail, I think it's really important to give you some kind of that reference point. You want to have a nice, nice contact on the strings. It's not your finger doing it. Go, give me a close up for a second. Don't do this where your finger's stabbing it so much as your whole arm, your whole hand is moving, and what's happening is your finger is actually rigid, so that you make really good contact with the string, and then when you pull off, pull slightly up or push slightly down, so it almost creates this kind of oval. You can kind of see that motion there. And then a basic simple pattern, if you've never done this before, just a great way to start would just be with your basic three note pattern, the, the eruption thing. First finger, fifth fret, second string. And we're gonna hammer on to our fourth finger on the eighth fret, second, and we're gonna tap 12. So the way I would do that is I get all set up with my finger over 12, and I'm gonna just pull that string off to five, hammer to eight, tap to 12. Pull off to five, hammer to eight, to 12. And that's the idea for tapping. And again, send in your videos of you working on tapping. If there's more we need to cover on this, we certainly will. And I'm sure it'll just happen because again, it's a technique. It's one of my very, very favorite techniques. It combines all the legato of slides, hammer-ons, pull-offs, bends, along with some better, or not better, but some different intervals than you might otherwise be able to do. So let's take a few questions and then we're gonna get to our uh, welcome to the stage. From David Meltzer in reference to the opening solo, one of my favorite solos, great way to start. And how's it going, Dave? 
Um, you know what? It's funny about that is, if, you know, in all fairness, I haven't played that in forever. And I sit there, I hit a G chord, at, you know, just maybe 10, 15 minutes before the show started. I just hit a G chord doing some stuff with the loop. And that was the first solo that jumped out. I haven't played it in forever, but I heard it all of a sudden in my head. So I sat here and had to remind myself how to play it to make sure I had a pretty good idea of what it was. And I even played the last note wrong. I went to a low octave on the G. And Josh, our sound guy's like, no, dude, that's not right, man. You got to play the higher note. And so, uh, you know, I got, I got corrected. I got schooled today. And, uh, but it made the solo better. So thanks, Josh. That was way cool of you. Um, so yeah, cool solo. I'm glad you enjoyed that. That was Knocking on Heaven's Door. I did the Guns N' Roses version for people who didn't catch the intro. Uh, from, from, is it, it J, how do we say Jaw? Is it Yaw? Is it Jaw? Is it, do we know? No? Well, Jaw, I'll go Yaw, Jaw. <laughs> it's a great name. I, I wish I had a two letter name. How cool. That, I, I wish that was only my name, was just two letters. That's very cool. Uh, apparently thinks this is an awesome show, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. That's rad. Thanks for joining us. Is there a way to mimic that tapping sound without actually doing it? Um, hammer ons will do that. That's a great question. I never quite thought of that. Um, hammer ons and pull offs obviously will do that. But a lot of times you've got to have a little bit bigger intervals because typically when you're tapping, you're not tapping in the same space. I've never thought of this. This is actually really cool. But you're not typically tapping in the same space as your left hand. You're usually you know, a little further intervals out, a little further distance. So I think what you might consider is do bigger stretches. Maybe if you did like, uh, you know, uh, if you did kind of an 059, that interval from that open note all the way up to that fifth, up to the nine. Those are some bigger intervals that will kind of mimic that sound a little more. Let's see. Yeah, I think hammer-ons and pull-offs are gonna be the closest thing you're gonna get to it. Primarily hammer-ons, is right that. And one of the things you can do when you're actually doing that though is mute out the strings you're not playing on. I, th I think of, uh, what is that song, uh, ACDC. Thunderstruck, right? A lot of times I'm teaching students that they're having a real, you know, they might be trying to do hammer-ons and pull-offs as an exercise. But they're getting all those other notes around them to ring. So what I'll have them do is take their right hand, go close up here. They'll have them cover strings three and, and one, right? So you see those are covering those. And then they're gonna play on string two so they can be really aggressive with their left hand. Right? You have basic grip, but you can be really aggressive without having to worry too much. And just uh, with your left hand being sloppy so much, is getting good contact with the strings and hitting the strings a little harder. Uh, that's kind of a cool thing also, but that's probably the best way we're going to mimic that sound. Ron Worley, green tinted 60s, mined by Mr. Big. Wow, trying to embarrass me on my own show. Uh, yeah, I remember that riff. That's an incredible riff. Let's talk about that. And you know what? I'm going to tie that to what we just did because the riff was one of those riffs I was really stoked when I learned it. It was really challenging for me when I first learned it because your eyes have to kind of go back and forth across the fingerboard. So I will try to pull this off for you. But it also makes a great example for keeping your pick in the ready position because there's some picking as well as some legato phrasing. The riff. Uh... Okay, that's what I was, okay. So pick in the ready position. Okay, now right there, that was a really great example in muscle memory. Okay, I played that riff a billion times, but a long time ago. I haven't played it really that recently. I can't remember uh, before today when I played that riff, but it's, it's been a while. Point is, is when you really learn something, that recall comes pretty darn quick. But that's a great riff. Um, you might want to look that up, find a, an instructional video on that. We don't have time to do it today. But if you were to look that riff up and try to learn that, that's really neat. We've got these hammer ons with the pick. Pull off, another one, another pick. And then the rest is a pick, and then... There's some slides in there, all that good stuff, but a really legato phrase, really cool one. Uh, next one from Blue. Hey Blue, welcome to the show. Every time I try tapping, it sounds really quiet or just bad. What am I doing wrong? One of the big cheats for tapping is a more distortion. You're gonna get more noise, but it makes the notes pop a little bit better. The other thing is when you attack the string, it's gotta be not only hard, but it's also gotta be fast and direct, deliberate. Meaning if I, if I on a note, when I hit it, it's gotta be just bullseye. When I attack it, it's 
hard and I'm trying to push my finger through the wood on the guitar. I mean, when I'm first doing it and learning, you should get a pretty good callus on your finger. It should hurt. When it starts to get sore, take a break. My daughter, I'm not kidding, my daughter uh, last week, it was the coolest thing ever. She, she FaceTimes me while I was doing some lessons or I was doing some video or something. And I take the call because, you know, whenever she calls, I'm like, okay, she's cool. And, and she shows a close up of her, and she actually got a blister on her finger from practicing guitar last week. First time that's happened. I haven't seen anybody do that in a while. And it's because she was playing this one phrase of a. Some, I think it's Arctic Monkeys was the song she's working on. I can't remember the riff, but something like that. But you can see all that sliding that was going on with her third finger on these big strings, and it just it gave her a blister. Same thing with tapping. The sliding will really do that to you, especially if you're on the wound strings, the rough strings. Um, that can be uh, problematic for you, so be careful of that. But really, just get that basic. Doesn't matter what notes. And just get that, or just back and forth between two notes. In fact, make it sound like a, let's see. <laughs> make it sound like a European ambulance, right? That's kind of cool. Uh, next thing, so that's, that's my best advice for you. And then from Rodrigo, do I need to change the action on my guitar to get better taps? You don't, but I will tell you my cheat when I was younger. Tons of distortion and nine gauge strings. I had lighter strings, so that was um, a much easier way to do it because with a lighter gauge string, you don't have to press the string nearly as hard. The, the problem there is you'll get more pitchy issues where you'll tap a note and it might bend a little bit out. And so, you know, be careful there. If you feel like you're getting good taps, stick with your tens if that's what you have. But nines are going to probably be a little bit easier to do the whole tapping thing. And uh, so that's pretty much questions and all that. I appreciate you guys asking all that and let me demonstrate the tapping stuff. It's really a, a fun technique. And again, we'll, we'll get more into that in future episodes. But what I want to do now is I want to welcome to the stage. We have a couple of Elixir artists this week that are here to inspire you. Uh, it's Phil Short and Greg Karras. And uh, we'll take a look at what they have to show us. Both of those were totally cool and for different reasons. I was super stoked. That's the first time I've seen those and they were both rad. I loved the second one. I loved how it had kind of a, a bluesy rock thing, but then really put a little bit of fusion and some, some shred into it. That was cool. I didn't expect that. So it was kind of that, that bluesy rock thing for a bit. Way cool. First one was amazing. Also, I, what I loved about that was just the technique was just pristine. Um, just amazing player guys. Thanks for sending those in. We appreciate that. And I do have a question on that Friedman guitar. It was a rad guitar. I just want to know where that dent came from, man. You, that's a good story right there. I'm, I'm certain of it. But uh, great tone and great feel. And, and you guys saw everything those guys were doing. It's one of the things I truly love about Elixir Strings is how much we can beat on these things and typically not have any issues with them. And that's, that's a true statement right there. I'm watching them bend the strings and do crazy stuff. And, and they just really, they keep their tuning. They, they stay, um, they typically don't break. Very rarely do I break a string. That said, I'm sure to break a string on this episode, but it's pretty rare. Anyhow, uh, thanks, uh, thanks to Elixir for sending those in. We really appreciate that. And the good news is, is now it's time for you to take the lead 
And by you taking the lead, that means we're going to look at what the poll results were. And let's see what they were. You guys voted. And um, the winner is, oh, there we go, Mark's Roadshow Stories. Okay, we haven't done this one in a while. And I always have one or two in the back of my mind that come to mind uh, when I think about this. So when we're talking about roadshow stories, for the better part of 13 years, I spent a fair amount of time on the road canvassing North America for Taylor Guitars, doing clinics and uh, NAMM shows and you know different events, different sales events or whatever. Really fun time in my life. I had a great time with all the guys, a really cool company, good people, great, great guitars. Everything across that's a really cool, cool organization. And one of the things that was neat about that was getting to go and do these shows. I would get to meet a lot of people, people that watch this show even now, people that I would never would have met otherwise and get to meet them in person, hang out with them, sometimes have a bite, whatever. And we always had, at the shows, we always had some really cool musical moments, some really cool dialogue and, and got inspired. And that was one of the funnest parts about doing those shows. So when we were on the road though, after the shows, we'd either invite some people to go with us or we'd take the store with us or whatever, whoever was hosting the event. And we'd go out and we'd have dinners and, and, and drinks and whatnot. And it was just always a really fun time. And I remember one night in particular, I was with a guy named Aaron, good dude from, from Taylor, really funny guy, very knowledgeable. Like if he watched this show, he'd win every name that tune in about the first one second, he'd have the answer to it. We played it one time. I think he beat me like 39 to one uh, while we're driving around listening to 70s, 80s, 90s, et cetera on, on Sirius Satellite. But we were out and we, we were with some, some really cool people. We had a great show. I'm sure we sold a handful of guitars and how kind of celebrating. And when we used to do road shows, we would, we would go to an area and we'd canvas an area. I mean, we'd, we'd fly into, I might fly into Georgia, fly into Atlanta, and we'd, we'd rent a van and we would go, you know, up to Charlotte or we'd go to Savannah and to Charlotte up to, you know, Myrtle Beach or to Raleigh or whatever. We'd just kind of make our way up the, the eastern seaboard or whatever it is. And every night was something kind of different. Well, when we did that, we would take, once we'd get there, the first place we would go, we'd have all of our guitars, or sometimes we'd have you know, 25 guitars, 30 guitars, really nice guitars, probably, you know, I don't know the price tag, but you know, 60 to $80,000 worth of guitars in a van. We were always terrified about that. We'd take them and put them in the hotels at night. We'd make sure we, we safeguarded them. And if we went to go to a restaurant, we, know we, we would always cover them with, with black sheets and pull the, the van up to the front of the restaurant and, and be really safe. And, so one night we're out with these, these people from, I can't remember the store, but I think, it, I want to say it was in Louisiana. And we're having a great time. Everything's just really fun. And, and we always have this big fear, you know, we don't want to ever be the ones where the guitars got stolen, you know, and there's a handful of other guys doing what we were doing. So there's, you know, at any given time, there's, you know, four or five, you know, vans out there doing the same thing. And none of us wanted to be that one that it happened to us. And they never did, thank God. Uh, but uh, one night we're having a great time and we get done, it's time to leave. And we go out and we'd parked in the very front and backed it in. And we come out and the van is gone. And my heart sank. Aaron's like, we're looking around, we're freaking out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the van's, it was, it, it was right here. And I was like a little white Toyota where we had a big black van, you know? And we're walking, and so my heart's racing. I'm just, I'm thinking the worst. Aaron's thinking the worst, everybody's freaking out. And I spot a police officer right in the parking lot at the end. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a cop there. Maybe they saw something, you know, I'm thinking we're, we're safe. I start running to the cop and the dude from the store grabs me and pulls me back and just starts cracking up and tells me not to say anything to Aaron. They had taken our keys off the table, moved our van and, uh, and actually hid the van from us with a pile of guitars for, it, it, was, it felt like 10 minutes. It was probably 90, it was probably a minute. And uh, one of the best pranks I've ever had played on me in my life, I'm sure that's probably true for Aaron as well. So. It, we, you know, it was just absolutely terrifying. So when I think about going on the road, there was a pile of different events, not just like that, but that impact where you think back, oh, wow, I got to do this thing where I got to travel and have this fun, but, you know, and do these shows, but you also get these memories of, of uh, experiences like that. And that was one of my favorite ones. I thought that was just like, when it was all said and done, I caught my breath and life was okay. I was like, wow, that was, that was elaborate and very cool. So that was this week's, uh, my story from the road. That was just one that I thought of today and made me super stoked. Uh, some questions. Let's go into some Q and A, and then we'll do our um, our name that tune a little bit. How many guitars do I actually have? I lost count from anonymous. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. I've lost count for sure. I honestly haven't looked in a long time. In fact, the guitar I brought on last week's show, the only reason it made it to last week's show was my daughter pulled it out of my closet, and I saw it sitting out. I'm like, why is this guitar sitting out? So I restrung it and cleaned up the neck. And I'm like, wow, I love this guitar. So I don't know, I mean, you know, like most guitar players, I have a lot, maybe 20 or 30 or 25, somewhere in that range probably. And you have no idea where they are. They're all safe and they've got booby traps. So don't come, in, don't come near me. 
Uh, can I do a bit of Thunderstruck? I, you know, I can. In fact, I would even ask you guys, is Thunderstruck, is that riff picked or is it hammer-ons and pull-ons? Is he... Or is it... I know there's some kind of a click track on there, so the click can sound like a picking motion. I've never, you know, really tried to play it super accurate. And then the, the walk down part. Or picked. Is it? Yeah. Now you can tell I obviously have not picked that one a lot because I typically will use that as a really cool legato exercise or hammer-on pull-off exercise for my students. So I always have them try to do the hammer-ons and pull-offs with that. But it's a great picking exercise if it's done that way. And if someone knows the answer to that, I'd love to know. Sky Green, what's up, Sky? You may be on a future show here because I might have to take a week off at some point. I've got a couple things maybe coming up. So Sky, get, uh, get ready, start planning something fun for these people. And uh, she says, killing it as always, so much fun watching you in the show. Well, everybody here is like waving at you and they, uh, they all miss you. Time's looking at you, go, hey. So thanks for joining in, Sky, appreciate it. Uh, next thing from Novak, does it sound better to have a crappy guitar going into a great amp or a great guitar going to a crappy amp? Which is more worth the cost? Well, I, I would certainly say go with the better guitar first. Get a guitar that's going to stay in tune, good pickup, something you're really happy with, something you can play well, something, all that. That's going to be really important because that is your craft. And a big part of your tone is not only in just the guitar itself, but how your hands uh, react with the guitar, right? So it's the bone tone, they call it. The, you want your hands and the guitar to be really good. Get good clean pickups, good and all that stuff where you're, you're happy with the guitar stays in tune when you're doing the style of music you want to play. Because even on a really bad amp, if you're playing well and you've got good tone and the guitar's in tune, that's going to sound a lot better than a guitar that just can't simply be in tune or sounds thin and really weak. Even though you have a better amp, that's just going to expose more of the weakness of the guitars. Never thought of that until I just thought through it out loud like that, and that makes a lot of sense. I, I actually really subscribe to that, that advice. From Rodrigo, how has being a guitar instructor helped your guitar playing? It's a wonderful question. It's, it's been invaluable in that I could not do half the stuff I can do with an instrument today or understand half the theory I know had I not had to learn it and then go back and teach it and then make it, make it uh, understandable for other people. Because when you teach, you know, I, I've got students that need visual learning. They've got kinetic, they just want to feel it. I've got others that need to hear it and break it down. And you have to learn, sometimes I'll teach the same student the same thing three different ways until one finally clicks. And when you keep doing that over time, you yourself begin to really understand it. You know, there was a hand, I mean not a handful, there was a bunch of times where I would teach something that I was taught, right? And I, I knew it, I memorized it, but I didn't understand it. And as I'm teaching, all of a sudden a light went on. Similar to when I was just giving the advice about the guitar. I've never thought about guitar or amp, but as I thought through it, that made sense. I've never given that that thought, and it's a good answer, you know, and it makes sense. But you know, sometimes you have to really process something rather than just memorize it. And I think that was one of the things. The other thing about being an instructor, I think it's good for anybody if you have the ability to do so, is it really keeps your finger on the pulse of contemporary music because you're going to have, say you do 20 lessons a week, you have 20 different students coming in, typically from a myriad of ages and backgrounds and styles, that are going to bring in what's hip to them. And so you're going to have the, the, you know, the 60 year old dude that wants to play some Zeppelin tunes as well as the 13 year old girl that's going to want to play some Taylor Swift tunes or, you know, and everything in between. You're going to get the shredder 19 year old kid that just crushed it in high school and now he's ripping and he wants to play Guthrie Govan stuff, which in that case I got to refer him out to somebody better than myself. Um, but yeah, it, it keeps your finger on the pulse of modern music because I don't, this is a really weird thing. I don't listen to a lot of music because I play so much music that when I'm in the car, I often listen more to talk radio or podcasts. Um, but when I do listen to music, you know, I, I, I kind of have an idea what's going on because it's because I had to teach it to somebody and something stuck that I liked. Or, or even listening to what my kids bring into the home. That's cool, too. I've never played with a backing track. Should I be using one? And if so, when? From Jamie. I, I think playing the backing tracks is also really valuable. I think the thing you need to do there, though, is make sure you play to different background tracks and in different keys, but not all in the same session. Pick a background track, pick a key, get pretty comfortable with it for a day or two, and then move on to another one, shift the patterns, Find keys that are relatively close to each other, meaning you know, if, you, if you're playing in the key of A minor, maybe tomorrow you try B minor or G minor, so all of your patterns shift only two frets, one direction or the other. Uh, try different tempos, because you might get really good doing triplets at 90, but triplets at 60 is actually harder for some reason, or vice versa, if you have to play faster. 
Uh, and the other thing is the styles. You, you know, we all peg ourselves. I'm, you know, I'm a rocker. Or I'm a, I love country or I love rap or whatever it is we think we like. When you can expose yourself to more different influences and different styles of guitar playing, you may find you really like something more than you thought. And the case in point for me is my dad was a country artist and I obviously rebelled against country in my, my earlier years. And now it's, it's one of my, I'm not good at it, but it's one of my favorite styles of music to play. It's just a blast. And I've learned a lot in the last couple of years trying to get some of the hybrid picking stuff down, some of the voicing, some of the double stop bends and that kind of stuff. You know, I think, you know, just even hand strength, you know. Some of the, you know, there's just that. That whole like hybrid picking thing, it's so much fun. I never used to do that stuff, but I'm learning a lot from it and it's making me a better player and it's making me just have more fun on guitar. So I think backing tracks answer your question. That was long-winded. Yes, absolutely use them. The cool thing is, is uh, YouTube obviously has about 4 billion of them on there. So by that, you know, you just go on there and type in you know, backing track 80 BPM or a, you know, backing track A minor blues or, a, or whatever style you want to play and you'll find it and just sit and jam to it. When you do that, the other thing is to really make sure you have great tone, meaning, you know, we've said this before, you play to what you hear. If it sounds like crap, you play like crap. If it sounds good, you typically play better. Make sure your settings on your, your YouTube, if you can run it through better speakers so that sounds good. It sounds like you're really with the band. If, um, you know, your guitar sound, you really dial that in and make it something that you're happy with. So when you play, it's like it's inspiring to play. It, it's way more enjoyable and you, you tend to stick with it longer and it's just a better experience overall. Uh, that was from Jamie from Kazoo. What other instruments can you play? I play bass on a lot of my demos. I'll play bass. I just did my first ever cajon track. I actually threw down a cajon track on the, my song I wrote when I was out of town. Uh, I can play a little bit of piano, basic drum beat, but I'm primarily a guitar player, both electric and acoustic and 12 string and, and nylon. I can play all the guitars pretty you know, pretty, pretty reasonably. So with that, I think that's probably about uh, what we have. A oh, special late request, Van Halen's Hopper Teacher. Maybe play a little bit of it. All right. So Hopper Teacher, you know, I, I said, you know, doing the tapping thing. I've seen this riff played wrong a lot of times, and I'm not even claiming that I'm playing it right, but it sounds right. <laughs> and that's really what's important. Um, it's one of these things that's a big stretch with your left hand. Uh, the riff. <laughs> So the special sauce in there that when I actually tried to make it sound correct a long time ago was there's one thing that I'm not sure if he's doing it or not, but it's what I hear. And I, you know, again, I'm not claiming to be right. It just sounds cool. And it's kind of cool to learn it. Most people will play the notes up and back. And that's, that sounds cool and those are the right notes. But what you can actually do is when you hit the open note, if you can learn to do this, come back here, right here, I'm kind of tapping, not getting a note there, but kind of almost plucking the string when it goes back to open. So it's like this. And that extra, that extra smack on that last note or the beginning note, for some reason gives me that feel the rhythm sounds correct. So that's kind of the idea on that. And I just think that when you're doing this tapping things, everything we talked about earlier uh, is you're doing these things kind of applies here. You want to get the basic fundamentals of tapping down. This is one of those cases where even like eruption, it's kind of a, just a set pattern moving around. But there's something a little bit cooler about that when you can get that extra tap in there, that extra slap on the guitar. And the stretch will just absolutely work you, but it will give you the ability to ultimately play songs like that. You look at that stretch on... Uh, Message in a bottle, or I think, and I always refer to the stretch on on every breath you take. That that A major bar chord with, with that pinky out there, and you got to stretch that, right? And you got to come all the way down to this F sharp, which is brutal, right? And so things like that, that, and eruption, those the stretches will actually do a lot for you to help that along. If that makes sense. All right, it is time. I think we're going to do name that tune and then call it a day. It's been a lot of fun with you guys today. 
Name that tune. What do we win this week? I can't remember what's on the top. Do we have strings? Do we have a mug? What do we have? Anybody? What's that? Strings? All right, we have some elixir strings for you. And uh, whoever wins this now to play, I'm just going to play one rip, and you guys have to name the artist and the title. Spelling doesn't matter so much, but it's got to be the artist and the song title. It cannot just be one or the other. So with that, I'm going to play the riff. I might play it a couple times. And uh, let's see what we do. You all ready? Are you ready? Fingers on your keyboards. First one to put it in the chat box wins. Here we go. Love those last, that last section of chords. Anyone, anyone at all, do we have a winner? We don't have a winner, all right. Wow. I need to, I need to, oh my gosh, we might have to learn this riff next week on my uh, teaching selection of the, uh, or uh, teacher's choice. We do have a winner, Craig. Okay, Craig, did he get the right title? Everything we're good? We confirm that? All right, Craig Noel, nice job, Craig, congratulations. The song is Josie by Steely Dan. If you don't know that song or couldn't place it, go listen to it today. It's one of the greatest songs ever written. I absolutely love that song. I've done it even one of my concerts once. And um, just a ton, of, a ton of great chords involved, great feel, um, just a fantastic groove and, and the whole thing. So Josie by Steely Dan, Craig's a winner. Congratulations, Craig. We'll get some strings to you. Super stoked for you. And I think with that, basically what I like to say is this. Friend me on to our social media stuff. Friend me on Instagram, or not friend me, I'm sorry. Follow me on Instagram, as uh, we know, we're, we're hip, we know what we're saying. And uh, Take the Lead Official, that's our, our main page here, but also at Guitar Seal, that's my personal one. Get a little more kind of into my personal life. And then uh, watch the show every Thursday so far at three o'clock and tell other people about it. Make sure they know what's going on. If you want to share it on Facebook or Instagram, that would be awesome. And other than that, we'll see you back here next week on Take the Lead. Have a great week.